I'm Nala Ayed. Welcome to Ideas and to the second of the 2020 CBC Massey Lectures, Reset, Reclaiming the Internet for Civil Society, by world-renowned internet communications and security expert Ron Diebert. We've got a problem. The internet, the great tool that was supposed to put information at everyone's fingertips and make the world a whole lot better, has been taken over by forces that seem beyond our control. In his 2020 CBC Massey Lectures, Ron Diebert explores what went wrong and what we might do about it. Ron Diebert is director of Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto, a research group that focuses on digital threats to human rights and civil society. They've investigated cyber attacks against Mexican journalists, disinformation spread by Iran, and the hacking of the Democratic Party emails in 2016. In his 2020 CBC Massey Lectures, Ron Diebert ranges over many of the issues that plague the internet and social media. The latest insights into the psychology of marketing and the hacking of human behavior are being used to turn us into addicts. Our personal data is being vacuumed up, turning us all into products for sale. Governments in general, and malign players in particular, are using social media tools against us as a weapon. And the question is, what is to be done? There's no Massey Lectures tour this year, but we've assembled a panel to comment on what Ron Diebert is talking about. Some of the people you'll hear from time to time through the programs are writer and filmmaker Astra Taylor, human rights lawyer Chinmayi Arun, philosophy professor Tamsin Shaw, journalist and author Misha Glenny, former Google executive Meredith Whitaker, journalist and author John Naughton, and political scientist Daniel Dudney. On Ideas, here's Ron Diebert with the second of the 2020 CBC Massey Lectures. This is Lecture 2, The Market for Our Minds. Part 1, Why Edward Snowden Matters. It's late 2013. Blockbuster reports of state surveillance are dominating the news cycle, courtesy of former National Security Agency contractor and whistleblower Edward Snowden. I settle into a lounge in Toronto's Pearson International Airport and boot up my laptop. I click the I accept button for the Wi-Fi agreement and connect with a virtual private network to Citizen Lab servers, effectively wrapping my internet connection in an encrypted tunnel. Reflexively, I pause to consider whether I've made any minor errors in my digital security routine that would inadvertently expose my sensitive communications. Does this really protect me from a sophisticated threat actor? There is slight relief as the VPN flashes connect and the encryption is complete, but the anxiety never fully disappears. Among the emails in my inbox is one from an investigative journalist from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation who wants to speak to me. I plug my headphones into my iPhone and call. He has a lead on the Snowden disclosures. Greenwald and company have shared with us some of Snowden's cash that relates to Canada's spy agency, he explains, referring to journalist Glenn Greenwald, one of a very small handful to whom Snowden entrusted his materials, and we want to get your confidential input. Oh, really? Sounds interesting, I reply. Tell me more. It seems to be some kind of top-secret program to spy on Canadians here in Canada, he says in hushed tones as if whispering over the phone would shield us from unwanted surveillance. It's difficult to interpret the slides, he continues, but it looks to be some kind of real-world proof-of-concept experiment in which CSEC, the Communications Security Establishment, Canada's Signals Intelligence Agency, is tracking travelers by hacking into Wi-Fi hotspots in domestic airport terminals and lounges, including Toronto's Pearson Airport. Toronto's Pearson Airport? Hacking Wi-Fi hotspots in lounges? I look around me with new apprehension, over my shoulder, down at my laptop, at the mobile phone in my hand. I focus on the ceiling above and survey the scattered Wi-Fi routers with their green lights and antennae. 
what once seemed innocuous suddenly feels ominous. Situated between them, in numbers that start to feel very oppressive, are the many black dome surveillance cameras. These cameras are omnipresent in just about every public space these days. Countless individuals pass underneath their constant gaze, seemingly oblivious to their very existence or purpose. Except me right now. I scrutinize other travelers. Nearly everyone has a mobile device in their hands or a laptop open in front of them, or both. There's a couple comparing matching fitness trackers on their wrists. A young teen, thumbs tapping frantically, is immersed in a mobile game. His parents, meanwhile, are preoccupied with their respective devices. No one speaks to anyone else. Business people are pacing around, pinching their headset microphones close to their mouths, each of them siloed in serious conversation. I imagine waves of data emanating from all of their devices outward in continuous pulses, filling the airport lounge with intersecting bits of information that only I can see. Email addresses, usernames and passwords, IP addresses, timestamps, session IDs, device identification numbers, SIM card information. Are you still there? He asks after an extended silence. Yeah, I respond, now with trepidation. I'll tell you what. Given that I'm sitting right in one of those very airport lounges as we speak, how about we pick up this conversation another time in person? Admire him or not, almost everyone would agree that Edward Snowden is a thoughtful person, and he deliberated carefully over what to do with the enormous cache of top-secret materials he had purloined from the U.S. government. Rather than publish them wholesale on the Internet via WikiLeaks or another dump site, he chose to hand them over to a few select journalists for vetting. This arrangement created a safety check of sorts, a way to remove Snowden himself from the decision loop and publish only material that the journalists, their editors, and the experts they consulted concluded was in the public interest. Snowden's trove of materials, released in slow-drip fashion, showed that government spy agencies had been quietly thriving in the shadows on an epic scale. They had studiously developed astounding capabilities involving bold operations to reap a harvest of intelligence data from across the planet's information and communications infrastructure, most of it behind our backs. But there was also an important subtext, a more nuanced story, one that may have been easy to overlook. What seemed upon first blush to be principally about Orwellian state surveillance was about something far more complex and disturbing. It was a story not solely about a deep state apparatus, an unaccountable other that was pulling strings behind a veil of classification to monitor us unwitting victims. It was, rather, about something in which we were all complicit. The National Security Agency, NSA, and its allied agencies had not so much constructed an information-gathering system of their own from scratch as piggybacked on an already existing, deeply entrenched, and widely dispersed system of surveillance spawned by private enterprises and fed by our culture of digital hyper-consumption. By 2013, commercial data collection efforts dwarfed what any spy agency could do alone, even one as well-resourced as the NSA and its estimated $11 billion annual budget. In other words, the Snowden disclosures offered not only a window into secret state spying, as importantly, they offered a window into ourselves. For example, there was the infamous PRISM program, the second Snowden-related bombshell reported by the Washington Post and The Guardian on June 6, 2013. The initial coverage of the PRISM program mistakenly described the NSA as tapping into the servers of Facebook, Apple, Skype, Microsoft, and other high-tech giants with some kind of direct access. In fact, the data was turned over to the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation by the companies under lawful access procedures and then shared with the NSA. Others followed the same convenient arrangement. 
Under the auspices of a top-secret program called Dishfire, for example, the NSA was able to, quote, take advantage of the fact that many banks use text messages to inform their customers of transactions, end quote, and thereby monitor international financial exchanges. Another NSA presentation showed how the agency had piggybacked on, quote, the tools that enable internet advisors to track consumers using cookies and location data to pinpoint targets for government hacking and to bolster surveillance. A program codenamed Happyfoot showed that the NSA and its UK partner, the Government Communications Headquarters, were exploiting the location data leaked by popular mobile apps. To help locate targets of interest, the NSA collected hundreds of thousands of contacts from instant messaging and email applications. On and on the stories went, following the same pattern, an astounding digital vacuum cleaning operation up and down the entire infrastructure of global communications networks owned and operated by the private sector. The infamous collect-it-all mentality that guided post-9-11 signals intelligence gathering was a response to an apocal shift in communications technology and practices that had taken place outside of the realm of international espionage. In but a few short decades, our everyday world had been thoroughly digitized and networked from the inside out. For the NSA and its partners, this revolution in personal data practices marked the dawn of the golden age of signals intelligence. They were reaping what all of us had sowed, and they still do. In September 2013, the German newspaper Der Spiegel published an article about an NSA program to exploit unpatched vulnerabilities in Apple, Google, BlackBerry, and other smartphones. A line on the slide from an analyst seemed to sum up best this historic shift in state-society relations. Summoning George Orwell's dystopian surveillance classic, 1984, the analyst asks, referring to a picture of Apple's then-CEO, Steve Jobs, who knew in 1984 this would be Big Brother and the zombies would be paying customers? Those paying customers? Those zombies? Turns out, that's all of us. Uh, this is Daniel Dudney. The technological enabling uh, that's happened here, you know, that's the, the basic story. Everyone knows this, right? We've got this enormous empowerment that has taken place. The technology has just gotten relentlessly better now uh, for well over half a century. And uh, I think that the, the news is that this is not finished yet, that the technological revolution is going to make possible distributed sensors that are going to get uh, ever more capable. All this data is going to be assembled through all of these networks. Uh, and the question of how we humans, how liberal democratic societies, a subset of humans, interact with these technological possibilities is, as Ron argues, I think very compellingly, going to determine the viability of liberal democracy and ultimately, you know, perhaps even uh, autonomous human consciousnesses. Hello, this is Chidmay Arun. It's, it, it's really valuable to think of state surveillance in this particular way that it didn't take place as it used to, where the state had to go and gather up the information, almost creating the data sets by itself, but that it was easily able to hoover up information from surveillance that is already taking place and that is more pervasive than it arguably has ever been in human history. And the reason for that is both that the technological systems have managed to pervade intimate parts of our lives, not just through the social media where we choose to share information and thoughts, but there's more. So Laura Dinaris, for example, says that we now need to start thinking of this in terms of cyber physical systems, the cars in which we drive, the GPS that tracks where we go. Our phones have GPS on them as well. Several of us use fitness trackers that track not only where we go, but often our heart rate and the times of day in which it goes up, and the times of day in which it goes down. 
there are smart coffee makers. The joke is there are smart fridges, but it's actually not that funny because a smart fridge knows exactly what you are eating, what your allergies are. And so this is all the information that is on one hand being gathered in a way in which it never was before, but also computing power makes it possible for it to be stored and processed as it has never been before. And the state surveillance system is layered on top of that, which makes it very powerful for reasons that have nothing necessarily to do with the state gathering the data. Part two, surveillance capitalism. Good morning, Alexa, you murmur bleary eyed. The sun peeks through the blinds that were automatically drawn to half-mast 30 minutes ago while you were still asleep, just how you like it. The smell and sound of the coffee maker brewing down the hall makes you salivate like Pavlov's dog. As the familiar chimes of the opening credits to BBC World Report drift in, you roll over and grab your mobile device off the bedside table. Accelerometers, gyroscopes, and other motion detectors buried in the hardware of your device confirm you're awake. As you bring it closer, its built-in camera and infrared diode scans your face and retina to automatically compare its stored biometric data against thousands of data points it can read. Satisfied within a split second that it has identified you, it then unlocks itself passing no judgment whatsoever on your early morning appearance. While you may have been asleep for many hours, your device has been working relentlessly. Apps that you left open have been communicating home, sending data in short, regular bursts across the internet. Algorithms of many companies and platforms have been busy digesting the data you have shared with them, and which they in turn share with numerous other third parties, data brokers, all with the intent to know you better. You first open your Instagram feed, then Facebook, then Twitter. A screen roll of last night's boozy parties that you did not attend flickers to life. You swipe and move on, but the apps take note of how long you lingered. There's another toddler picture. Is that my nephew or someone else's? An obligatory funny cat video. A ridiculous Donald Trump tweet. An inspirational poem from your aunt. Another mass shooting. Should I sign the petition? And then an ad for a special on an exclusive Hawaiian resort. Um, weren't we just talking yesterday about going to Hawaii? I swear Alexa's listening to everything we're saying. If this, or something closely approximating it, is not your normal morning routine, it may soon be. It is already for hundreds of millions of your fellow humans. Make no mistake, the platforms that run it all want this to be your routine too, just as they want it to be universally extended to everyone else on the planet. A mere 20 years ago, this would have been the stuff of science fiction. Now it's becoming an everyday reality. It seems like only yesterday that pundits fretted about how to make money off the internet. Throughout the 1990s, investors were shoveling billions of dollars at startups managed by 20-somethings. And yet, no one seemed to have a clear vision of a viable business model for the web. Everyone hoped that some kind of monetary magic would materialize out of technology that itself seemed to be magical. Analysts would later dub these hopes an irrational exuberance after it all came crashing down in the spectacular dot-com bust of 2000, when the value of internet companies plummeted suddenly after what seemed like unstoppable success. However, the bust did not last long. Under pressure to earn money, principals at Google adjusted their strategy. Previously averse to monetizing their users' search behavior, Google founder Sergey Brin and Larry Page did an about-face and started tying advertisements displayed modestly at first on the margin of their website to users' search queries. In doing so, they not only boosted Google's market value astronomically, but helped create a model of how to derive revenue successfully from internet connectivity and all of the services that were being given away online for free. Their experiment led to a massively successful initial public offering in 2004 and a market valuation of $23 billion. 
Google's success would be quickly emulated by Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, and numerous other players in the social media universe. These innovations in personal data surveillance were initially restricted principally to business on the internet. But the model that Shoshana Zuboff memorably helped christen surveillance capitalism would spread like wildfire to encompass and eventually dominate the entire global economy. At the core of surveillance capitalism is a relatively simple concept. In exchange for services given to consumers, mostly for free, industries monitor users' behavior in order to tailor advertisements to match their interests. This new form of information capitalism, Zuboff explains, aims to predict and modify human behavior as a means to produce revenue and market control. Surveillance capitalism did not emerge out of nowhere and certainly did not just spring from the minds of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs like Page and Brin. There was a prehistory to the personal data surveillance economy, a social and historical context that reaches back decades and even centuries. Its ground was prepared long ago with the rise of the early modern bureaucratic state and its mass record keeping, which helped encode individuals as units of information that could be measured, compared, and socially sorted. Starting in the early 20th century, birth certificates, social security numbers, real estate and financial records, educational scores, and psychological profiles were increasingly adopted and standardized, making informational elements key attributes that define a person. Of course, we could not have this latest variant of capitalism without the emergence and spread of industrialization and capitalism itself, and especially some of its central characteristics, such as private property, wage labor, individualization, consumer culture, and especially the science of advertising. In a more immediate sense, the blast off of social media could not have happened without innovations in telecommunications, digital computing, and network services, particularly the invention of the internet itself and the radical redistribution of information and communication exchanges that it permitted. Policy decisions were critical too, especially decisions in the United States to deregulate and privatize the telecommunications sector and legally insulate tech platforms from liabilities that traditional media face. All of these touchstones were essential to the causal pathways leading to surveillance capitalism. It would be an overstatement to say Google's innovations were preordained, but it would be correct to say that they couldn't have happened without these prior developments. Many of us were socially and economically prepared to embrace the personal data surveillance economy years before it came to dominate our lives and long before we started to fully appreciate its unintended consequences. This prehistory was like a pile of dry kindling waiting for a match to ignite the fire. The innovations of Brin, Page, and others like them to see personal human experiences as the raw material for a new kind of business model was just that spark. Surveillance capitalism is distinct from prior forms of capitalism, according to Zuboff. The novelty is to see our private human experiences as the free raw material that can be endlessly mined. On one level, it is the perfect sustainable resource. Our habits, preferences, relationships, moods, and private thoughts are like constantly replenishing wells. On another level, it is entirely unsustainable, dependent as it is on toxic mining of raw materials, rising energy consumption, and non-recyclable waste. Under surveillance capitalism, social media drill into personal human experiences by whatever ingenious means may be derived from their proliferating sensors, and then turn them into what Zuboff calls behavioral surplus proprietary data that is used for predictive signaling. The primary customers are not us, the consumers are users of social media. The real customers are other businesses that are interested in predictions of human behavior generated by the social media platforms and the data analytics machinery that surrounds them. 
We are simply a means to a larger commercial end. We're the livestock for their farms. Hi, Tamsin Shaw here. I think the idea that data brokers want to get to know us better is very significant. And I think there's more to it than that. They don't want to just get to know us. They want to use that knowledge to change us. So all advertising changes our behavior. It creates a demand for something or it gets you to buy something. And it might do that in ways that we don't even notice. But online, we can have micro-targeting that serves a much deeper purpose. So the ocean model that is used to do for this in military psyops and now in advertising, it stands for openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. That looks at our personality characteristics and selects those to see what might be exploitable. So for instance, I know that Cambridge Analytica discovered when they were intervening in the election that neuroticism was especially exploitable. That makes sense. Fear and lying to people work. So for instance, if you create a fear of immigrants or you create the fear that someone's going to lose their job, and you target specifically neurotic people, you combine that personality information with other data about them, for instance, the fact that they are deeply in debt or anxious about losing their homes, then that's a very potent combination of information to have about them. And you can exploit that neuroticism. And in doing that, I think we have to ask whether we're just making people neurotic about those particular issues or whether we're deepening that neuroticism more generally? Are we making those people more fearful and therefore more illiberal? So I think that is a big worry about the specifically online methods of targeting people. Hi, it's Misha Glenny here. And uh, Ron, you raised the issue of surveillance capitalism, and this is obviously a critical area. One thing that I think is very interesting about this is that it tends to emphasize inequality and it emphasizes inequality for a very important structural reason. Uh, in traditional capitalism, say manufacturing capitalism, uh, the owners of a factory in Marxist terms would soak up the capital that is produced by labour, the so-called surplus capital that labour produces. But in order to do that, it has to employ, say, 100 or 200 or 1,000 workers. Because humans are the key to manufacturing capitalism, it's quite unwieldy. And although you can make big profits, you still have to manage a lot of people. What is really revolutionary about what Google and Apple and Facebook and all the rest are doing is is that the key element to your business is data. And so that means that you don't have to manage a hundred or a thousand people. You have millions of people who are streaming towards you and giving up their data to you. But you only need very few people to manage that. And so what we see is an even higher concentration of capital flowing to a very, very small minority. And so one of the really damaging side effects of surveillance capitalism is to accentuate the already skyrocketing inequality between the 1% and the rest of the world. And that, I fear, contains a whole series of dangers in it, which we've already seen emerge during the pandemic. You're listening to the second of the 2020 CBC Massey Lectures, The Market for Our Minds by Ron Debert. This is Ideas in Canada on CBC Radio 1, on Sirius XM across North America, in Australia on RN and around the world at cbc.ca slash ideas. I'm Nala Ayed. 
It's looking as if the internet and social media have been taken over by extremists and bad actors. We've all been turned into addicts. Our personal data is being stolen and sold to the highest bidder. We're spied on and surveilled by foreign powers. And the phones and tablets we're all using are polluting the planet. So how do we get back control? On today's program, Ron Debert explores what's called surveillance capitalism. The economic engine that underlies social media, the personal data surveillance economy. Social media, he says, have one aim, to monitor, collect and sell to the highest bidder as much personal information as they can. This is The Market for Our Minds, the second of the 2020 CBC Massey Lectures. Here's Ron Deaver. Part three, the problem with apps. Social media, of course, do not openly describe themselves in the way social theorists and political economists do. Naturally, the platforms market themselves in much more anodyne ways. For example, instead of referring to its users as raw material, Facebook refers to them as a community. All the world's information at your fingertips a catchphrase trumpeted by Google executives, seems much more benign and empowering than what Google really does. An application that knows everywhere you want to go and tracks how you get there would likely freak people out. So instead, Google Maps describes itself as a tool that, quote, makes navigating and exploring your world faster and easier. Social media companies strive as much as possible to make all of the extraordinary surveillance of our personal lives seem, well, normal. As a product manager of Google's smart home system Nest said, you need different sensors and inputs and outputs across all the different rooms inside your house. And to the consumer, it needs to feel like one. Feel like one. In other words, all of the sensors that envelop and monitor you are so blended into the taken-for-granted reality, the unquestioned environment that surrounds you, that they become, in effect, invisible. The less we question this environment, the more platforms can undertake extensive surveillance of our behavior with as little friction as possible. Under surveillance capitalism, says Zuboff, Our ignorance is their bliss. There is an inertia, an inexorable logic to surveillance capitalism. This logic, manifest in each and every new social media innovation, compels platforms to acquire data about consumers from ever more fine-grained, distributed, and overlapping sources of information. These sources dig deeper into our habits, our social relationships, Our tastes, our thoughts, our heartbeats, our energy consumption, our sleep patterns, and so on. Each new source of data is like a door that opens, only to present yet another door to be opened. Amazon is developing drones to deliver their packages. Why not equip them with cameras to map the houses to see if their customers might want to purchase some new gutters? And now that we have that imagery, why don't we market it to the local police, too? Google's vehicles roam the streets collecting imagery for their Street View feature. Why not vacuum up internet data from open Wi-Fi hotspots while we're at it? Put simply, there is never too much data. Sensors are built upon sensors in an endless quest for yet more data about our lives. The endless quest to acquire more data invariably leads down a path towards the unguarded, subliminal, and other sub-rational components of our behavior, what the academic Jan Patios calls emotional extraction. How long we linger on an advertisement or an image might reveal something about our state of mind. How long we stare at something, or conversely, how quickly we swipe past a suggested link can be suggestive of some deeper personality trait or mood swing. Mining the mind for subtle effects is something that platforms can do without necessarily revealing overtly that they are collecting something from us. Consider an app called MindStrong Health, which describes itself as 
transforming the diagnosis and treatment of behavioral health disorders through the ubiquity of mobile technology. Drawing on a user's normal interaction with their device, how long they perform certain routines like typing and swiping, their algorithms develop an emotional profile from which deviations can be registered. The app's founders claim the app can help diagnose depression and other mental illnesses before they happen. They say the app can even predict how a person will feel next week, or at least how a person will perform on the Hamilton rating scale for depression. Kind of like a weather app for your mood. Think about that for a second. A weather app for your mood. You've heard of future crimes. Get ready for future breakdowns. All social media have a higher and lower level function. The lower level function is the apparent one. An application that you use to tease your brain is, for most people, nothing more than a game. But the game is just the window dressing for a higher level, more important function. To observe and acquire data about you, your device, your other applications, your contacts, your pictures, your settings, your geolocation, and so on. To take just one example, Zynga, the mobile app developer behind the popular Words with Friends, gives its games permission to access first and last name, username, gender, age and birthday, email, contacts from the address book, in-game purchases, the contents of chats between players and everything they post on the game's message boards, and approximate physical location. They also use cookies, beacons, and other digital tags to gather information on your IP address, your device's media access control address, the type of device you are using, as well as its operating system, and your browser information. While you and your friends are busy playing word games over the internet, Zynga is busy sweeping up everything it can about you to sell to data brokers. I suppose that is what Zynga means by its tagline, connecting the world through games. Not surprisingly, the social media world is awash in boondoggles and horror stories in which company engineers voraciously overreach for permissions, either through malign intentions, institutional inertia, laziness, or some combination of the three. Facebook's People You May Know feature is a classic illustration of permission overreach, driven by an insatiable lust for more user data. The feature, well known to social media users, suggests friends or colleagues with whom you might have some relationship and whom you might want to befriend. However, the function started to raise alarm bells when users reported creepy or otherwise disturbing and possibly harmful recommendations, like sex workers having their clients recommended to them as friends, or psychiatrists being revealed as the missing link among patients who otherwise did not know each other. Turns out that Facebook had quietly scanned users' entire email clients and kept all of the addresses to which a user had sent an email without disclosing that they would do so. The Internet of Things towards which surveillance capitalism is now directed will turn the average home into a showroom for these split personality, higher, lower level functionalities. Your dishwasher cleans the dishes, but it may also monitor your morning routine. Your fridge keeps food cool, but also tracks what you eat. Your light bulb illuminates your living room, but sends data on your day-to-day -day life back to GE. You watch television, while the television, in turn, watches you. Roomba vacuums your bedroom, but sends detailed maps of your house's dimensions to the company. It is noteworthy to reflect on just how the home and its relationship to our private lives is being thoroughly transformed through surveillance capitalism. Once the epitome of an individual's sanctuary and the primary metaphor for the concept of privacy, at least as it was mythologized in Western liberal political theory for privileged elites, the home has been turned completely inside out. 
the most minute details that go on behind closed doors, exposed as raw material to be mined by thousands of data analytics companies across the globe. John Norton here. That resonates sharply and painfully with me because the business model of some dominant companies, which we now call surveillance capitalism, it works as capitalism has always worked, essentially by appropriating and enclosing resources that were once thought of as being ownerless and then exploiting them for profit, in the process destroying our environment and endangering our survival as a species now. But just now, the resources that are being appropriated in the same way are our attention and our behavior. And for a time, that tracking, that monitoring, that surveillance of us kind of stopped at our front doors. But that's changed because the smartphone, the so-called smartphone and the so-called smart speaker broke through the barrier. Um, and any device now, I think, with smart in its title uh, is essentially a conduit for feeding detailed information about your most innermost thoughts and behavior uh, to organizations that who do not have your best interests at heart. This is Astra. Uh, I, this is you know such an important issue right now. I think it's quite important to begin by saying this isn't driven by consumer demand. There wasn't some constituency of people saying, you know what I really want? I want my vacuum to spy on me. <laughs> I wish that I had a fridge that would suck up all of my personal data and send it to some private entity, right? This is this is a, a system that's being imposed on customers. And, and why is that? It's, it's being imposed on us because there's huge profit to be made from our personal data. So this is something where, you know, we're essentially treated as a kind of, you know, <laughs> raw commodity <laughs> that's being exploited by these, these larger entities, these larger firms. And it's not something that, that we ever asked for. One scary aspect of this, and it, it was it was called out in that that finding final closing comment. You know, I think we have to be attentive to the fact that privacy is becoming a kind of luxury good. Uh, it's something that you know you have to have a level of affluence to be able to afford, to be able to cordon yourself off, to be able to you know pay to not use the free service, for example. And so that's a very worrisome development. Are we hurtling towards a future where only the most privileged have privacy and the rest of us are exposed and exploited. So this question of, you know, how are how, we can't separate ourselves and how our personal data is being used in these systems and the, the targeted ads we're seeing as individuals, we can't separate that from what other people are seeing. So I think we have to really care about what it is other people are seeing as a consequence of data mining, personalization, targeting, uh, because ultimately those consequences will impact us. We're not separate. Part four, unintended consequences. There are colossal unintended consequences of surveillance capitalism. Some of them we may not fully reckon with until today's younger generations begin to age and grapple firsthand with the blowback of their always on social media lives. Take the fact that today's social media engaged youth have had their private lives documented, categorized, published, and subjected to algorithms from the moment they were born. Proud parents unwittingly splash their children's biometric data over social media platforms, something for which the children are naturally unable to provide consent. Looking over my own extended family's Instagram and Facebook posts, there's a steady stream of minor lives under surveillance. Here's Johnny doing something silly, cooking his first cupcake, having a temper tantrum, beginning his first day at kindergarten, learning how to ride a bike. Before Johnny reaches adulthood, he'll have millions of data points fed into a distributed machine whose aim is to shape the choices he makes all before he's of age. While most parents fret about their children encountering inappropriate content on the internet, perhaps they should be more concerned about what happens when the internet, because of their own actions, is constantly encountering their children. A rash of unintended consequences surrounds DNA data, such as that collected by companies like 23andMe or Ancestry.com, 
a market that is exploding in popularity as genetic testing technology advances and curious customers want to know more about their lineage or health risks. Like all digital technologies, genetic testing services such as these have a higher and lower level function, including selling data they collect on their customers to third parties. For example, 23andMe and Airbnb have partnered to offer customers heritage vacations based on their genetic results. Large pharmaceutical companies could use genetic data to target users who have specific genetic markers with tailored advertisements for their drugs. That's no doubt why, in 2018, the pharmaceutical giant GlaxoSmithKline acquired a $300 million stake in 23andMe. Another obvious potential third-party client is law enforcement agencies, which can use genetic information to locate perpetrators of crimes, however those may be defined. And while specific customers of these services may inform themselves of the risks of handing over their genetic data to these companies and all third parties to whom they might provide it, none of that due diligence extends to those who share their genetic fingerprints. When you hand over your DNA data, you're not just handing over your own genetic data, you're handing over your entire families too, including those of future generations yet to be born. You might even be unwittingly selling out a brother or sister you never knew you had. Where is their informed consent? Perhaps the most profound unintended consequences will emerge around the chronic pervasive insecurity throughout the entire infrastructure of surveillance capitalism. Social media platforms are in a race to accumulate profits, corner market share, ship products and services before their competitors, and extract data from as many users as possible. Ensuring the security of their users and of their users' data is largely an afterthought. Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg's flippant mantra, move fast and break things, fully embodies this negligence. To be sure, data security is not entirely ignored, but security is only prioritized to the extent that it makes sense from a business perspective, that it helps mitigate some kind of liability. Fortunately for many digital companies, liabilities are light and entirely manageable relative to the monumental revenues. The existing market structure allows them to pass the costs of most of their pervasive insecurity onto their users. Add it all up and you have the situation we see on a near daily basis, massive data breaches and epic platform security failures. We can't reasonably expect companies to prioritize privacy and users' data security when the entire ethos of innovation is oriented in precisely the opposite direction, to dig deeper, relentlessly, into as many areas of human life as their sensors can reach as quickly as possible before their competitors beat them to it. Our privacy crisis is a crisis of design, as New York Times journalist Charlie Warzel puts it. Is my smartphone secretly listening to me? It's a question I get asked more than any other. Years ago, the answer used to be, no, at least not without your explicit permission. I felt pretty comfortable that was the case. There were always exceptions, like if your device was hacked and the operators turned on the microphone. We knew of plenty of cases like those. But surely companies themselves wouldn't go so far as to record users without permission. Or would they? And then, over time, my answer became more qualified. There was Shazam, the popular mobile app that users can employ to detect the name of a song and its artist being played on the radio. Turn Shazam on, hold it up to the speakers, and within a few seconds, you get a match. Talking heads, life during wartime, brilliant. Turns out Shazam was not just recording what you wanted it to record when you wanted to record it. A researcher who monitored the application's network traffic data discovered that it was drawing audio from its surroundings while it was on in the background, even when the app was set to off. The company excused the behavior by explaining it away as a convenience for the user. Quote, 
If the mic wasn't left on, it would take the app longer to both initialize the mic and then start buffering audio, and this is more likely to result in a poor user experience where users miss out on a song they were trying to identify. The direct effects of such a profound transformation in modes of communications are enormous, but the unintended consequences are likely to be far more unsettling. Social media are spawning an extensive and deeply penetrating web of sensors whose boundary knows few limits. All of us users, in turn, are being unwittingly drawn into this vast enterprise as both consumers and something akin to domesticated livestock in a post-industrial data farming industry. Without any explicit debate, personalized, mobile, always-on network devices have allowed tech platforms to appropriate our personal information as something they can own, as if all of our data was merely a res nullius, Latin for nobody's thing, there for the taking. Our likes, emotions, relationships, and thoughts have become their property. Coincidentally, Digitally herding and monitoring people in this manner turns out to be highly advantageous for government security agencies, as does the pervasive insecurity that provides them all with the keys to a seemingly endless number of convenient backdoors, as the Snowden disclosures revealed. With no cages to keep us penned up, social media must rely on tools and techniques to attract and keep our attention instead. The tradecraft of the decades-old advertising industry has been radically transformed into something approximating a real-time, continuous, and digitally enabled set of controlled experiments on billions of human subjects. But this environment has also enabled far darker and more insidious species to flourish as well, serving a different set of customers, whose aims are not to sell lipstick or vacations but to undermine public accountability, spread social division, and foster chaos. You've been listening to The Market for Our Minds, the second of the 2020 CBC Massey Lectures by Ron Debert. The entire lecture series will be on our website, cbc.ca slash Masseys, and you can also download the podcasts from our podcast page. Your local or online bookseller will have the book of the lectures, Reset, Reclaiming the Internet for Civil Society, published by House of Anansi Press. And now that you've been listening to the lectures, we're inviting you to send us the questions you have for Ron Debert. We'll be creating a special program to run with the rebroadcast of the series in March 2021. I'll be talking with Ron along with the guests you heard on the program, and we'll be discussing some of the questions you send us. So send your questions to masseyquestions at cbc.ca. That's masseyquestions at cbc.ca. Our partners in the Massey Lectures series are Massey College in the University of Toronto and House of Anansi Press. The Massey Lectures series is produced by Philip Coulter. Online production by Althea Madison, Andrew Noyan, and Sinisha Jolich. Our web producer is Lisa Ayuso. Technical production, Danielle Duval. Senior producer, Nikola Lukšić. The executive producer of the Massey Lectures and Ideas is Greg Kelly, and I'm Nala Ayed.